Mark Levinson is the co-chair of the real estate department uh, at um, the prestigious law firm of Sills, Cummins & Gross. He chairs the firm's Israel Business Practice Group. Uh, Mark was appointed by the President of the United States to be on the United States Commission for Preservation of American Heritage Abroad. And Mark is also the chairman of the New Jersey Israel Commission. Most important to us here at ZOA is that Mark is the national chairman of the board of the Zionist Organization of America. I had the distinct pleasure of working with Mark in our extremely successful campaign to get votes for the ZOA coalition in the WZC election. We're very excited about our opportunity to have influence there. I would like to turn the program over to Mr. Levinson now, and he will start the program. Mark, it's all yours. Thank you, Alan. Thank you both to you and Natalie for helping Natalie Lazaroff, our Director of Marketing and Communications, for helping to um, navigate the administrative aspects of uh, the Zoom uh, program for us today. Uh, we're delighted. Uh, we're having a very, as you know, we have a very significant series of Zoom presentations on incredibly topical items and very interesting personalities. We've been doing this throughout the pandemic and, and frankly, and we've had book clubs and, and, and other webinars and discussions of ZOA Matters. And the response has been fantastic. Uh, the numbers that we see on these webinars uh, encourages us to both continue and it is really a ratification validation of everyone's support uh, for ZOA that joins in. So uh, I'm delighted that on a very nice Sunday afternoon, we have a nice turnout today. And I wanna uh, turn it over to our really outstanding um, head of our Israel office, our ZOA representative in Israel, Dan Aluz. Dan is uh, relatively new to the organization, um, but he's a terrific hire. Um, Mort and I spent quite a bit of time on this and we're really very, very excited and it's a significant part of our organization on a going forward basis. Um, Dan is originally from Montreal, Canada. He moved to Israel after finishing legal studies at uh, Harvard of the North, McGill University, and he specialized in international law. He serves as an international law advisor uh, as part of his reserve duty. Dan worked in the International Law Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a legislative advisor to the Likud in the Knesset, as well as senior management positions in Israel's third sector. It's uh, my honor and, and pleasure uh, to invite Dan to really carry us through the uh, first uh, remaining elements of the half an hour of the scheduled one hour webinar. Dan. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, maybe since, as you mentioned, I'm new to the organization, so I'll start maybe by saying one word about how I see my role in this organization. Uh, my role as representative of ZOA in Israel is really to connect between the incredible work that ZOA does uh, in America and what happens here inside of Israel. And I think that's really incredibly important because at a time when we hear a lot here in Israel about post-Zionist tendencies in parts of the American Jewish community, uh, it's important for us to know that there is still an unapologetic, strong Zionist voice that stands with Israel. For example, if this webinar is about sovereignty, one of the fears against sovereignty here in Israel is that it will cause a rift or a crisis with American Jews. But when we in Israel hear that there is a strong Zionist voice for sovereignty, as we heard when ZOA did a campaign here in Israel about this, uh, it helps us make the right decisions. But enough about me. Uh, we really have an amazing speaker here today, so uh, let's focus on her. Uh, Attorney Yifa Segal is an international law expert, and she is also the director of the International Legal Forum, uh, a nonprofit proactive legal hub dedicated to global cooperation between lawyers, organizations, and activists from all over the world fighting against radical ideologies, terror, and the BDS movement. In the years 2013 and 2014, before she created the forum, uh, Ms. Seg Segal was the joint director of Tatspeed Press Service. Uh, they did also webinars with the ZOA in the past, uh, the only Israeli news agency disseminating news reports and footage in real time from Israel to media outlets, uh, outlets across the world. And previously, Prior to 2013, she was also a leading member of Shurat Adin, the Israel Law Center. 
So uh, Yifa, how are you doing today? I'm great, thank you. Thanks for inviting me, good to be here. So I, as you heard, the main focus here today is really about the subject of sovereignty. Uh, and one of the main arguments against sovereignty in the Judea and Samaria for Israel is that it's against international law. Is that true? <laughs> I, um, I think that, you know, the arguments that claim that, that uh, the Israeli possession of the territories is illegal is, are completely disguised as uh, legal arguments. This is... Uh, you know, just to give you one example to start with, people use, uh, when I say people, it can be a person on the street, it can be a law student, or it can be a, a head of state that says illegal occupation, for example, when illegal occupation, it doesn't even exist under international law. There is no such thing as illegal occupation. Uh, international law is completely indifferent to occupation, whether it's good or bad. So it's just to, one example to start with, to show you how this, is used uh, uh, basically, I, I think, many, many times to advance some kind of a political agenda, but it's a lot more convenient uh, to disguise it as a legal uh, argument, uh, you know, that it's illegal and we are criminals and there should be sanctions, uh, rather than to have a real honest political debate, which is, you know, fair enough, even within the Israeli society, there are different people with different opinions and that's exactly the, the, the point of democracy. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 it's so cynical when they disguise that as, as, as a legal claim when nothing really is truly behind that. So if, if we speak about Israel's rights to the land of Israel, can you explain to us what the source of these rights is on a legal <laughs> level? Um, yes. Okay, so you want to dive right into that. All right. Uh, so, look, I mean... The way that I see it, that there are a few uh, uh, sources and, uh, you know, the reason that I say that Israel has, uh, you know, thousands of years of history uh, uh, connecting the Jews to this land is, is mainly, as, mainly as a counter argument when people say when, when there's an indigenous people, when someone is uh, um, a native to the land, there is some kind of a right to self-determination that includes independence and sovereignty. And, and that is also a complete misrepresentation of international law, by the way, but uh, we'll get to that uh, with your permission. I won't start with that. Uh, but I will say that, yes, we, you know, the fact that the Jewish people uh, at least consistently have argued for thousands of years uh, to their connection and their presence here in this place does have a meaning at least as, an, as a counter argument. But if you talk about international law, then, you know, everything begins basically not in 1917 with the Balfour Declaration, but in 1920 in the San Remo uh, Resolution that came after World War I. And this was uh, uh, the first time, really, that uh, a legally binding, and this is very, very important, a legally binding uh, resolution was accepted by all, uh, uh, by the League of Nations at the time. This, was re this resolution was accepted in the San Remo conference, but then adopted by, you know, unanimously by the League of Nations. And that granted, basically, it put the wording of the Balfour Declaration, meaning the, you know, the connection between the Jewish people and the reconstitution of the Jewish national home in their ancestral homeland. And, and all that language that we saw first in the Balfour Declaration, again, into a legally binding uh, 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 resolution. And uh, there's another part of that resolution that uh, people you know, tend to forget or, or prefer to forget, but another part of that resolution talks about the Jewish right to both immigrate uh, uh, to, to the land of Israel and settle in every part of the land. So if we are talking about 1920 or 1922 when this was accepted, um, you know, obviously then we talk about the entirety of the territory of the British mandate uh, we can argue uh, uh, on the fact of whether it does or does not include Jordan, but for sure, for, uh, it does include Jerusalem, it includes uh, uh, Judea and Samaria, the Jordan Valley, or what uh, some would like to refer to as the West Bank. Um, so this is one thing, and I think it's good enough, because there was never any other uh, legal uh, uh, resolution that, that is legally binding that came after 
that either revokes this right that, that was given to the Jewish people or changes that in any way, shape, or form. So that is still valid. And, you know, if we talk about uh, um, um, United Nations uh, General Assembly resolutions, those are all non-binding. Those are all political resolutions. Those uh, have a political nature and not a legal nature. Now we can argue about that, why and how, and I can explain to you the history of the United Nations versus the charter of the League of Nations, but it doesn't matter. That's just the way it is. That's a fact. So nothing has ever changed those rights that were given to the Jewish people by a legally binding resolution in 1922. And there's another, I think, one of the most important legal arguments that was first raised by Professor uh, Eugene Kontorovich and, and, and Avi Bell uh, about a, a Latin principle in international law. I don't want to confuse you with Latin, but I'll just say it once. Uti possidetis that's, that's the That's the general idea. And why is that an important rule? Because uh, it was used numerous, numerous times in, in, the, in the 19th and, and 20th century, uh, uh, which, which really I think goes to show you how uh, important it is. And what does that mean? It means that when there's a situation of decolonization or the breakup of, a, of an empire or any, you know, this type of a situation, it really kind of uh, uh, changes the, the, uh, the situation on the ground, then there is a, um, it, to favor stability and peace, the most important thing is that the emerging state has the right to inherit, inherit the, uh, the previously existing borders. Okay, so this was used in South America, all over South America, it was used in, even in, in the break of, of Yugoslavia and many cases in Africa and Eastern Europe after the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union. So uh, basically, if we, if we try to see how that applies to our case, you know, once the mandate, the British mandate was terminated, uh, the British left, there was only one state that emerged from that situation, the state of Israel, the declaration of Israeli independence, meaning that international law grants this newly established state the right to inherit the exact uh, uh, borders of, of the pre-existing entity. So again, I mean, if you look at the map, this is where the borders of the min British mandates were, uh, uh, where today the state of uh, uh, Jordan begins or our border with the state of Jordan. And of course the territory includes Judea, Samaria, Jordan Valley and Jerusalem. Um, so I think those are the two main uh, uh, arguments that we have, there are others, uh, but it's very important for each and every one of us to, to know at least those two. Now, what, when we speak about sovereignty, can you please explain uh, what on an international law level is happening when Israel applies sovereignty to Judea and Samaria? <clears throat> what happens in terms of international law? Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question because if you ask my opinion, nothing. Because if you have the right for something, then you have the right and then your own democracy needs to decide what to do with it. And your democracy can, can, can agree to waive some of those rights or to give away some of the, those rights or, or, or to uh, uh, actualize uh, um, you know, sovereignty in, in the entirety of the territory. Uh, so that, according to international law, what should happen. Uh, again, I'm not talking about politics, di you know, di diplomatic issues, different problems, whatever you want to tell me that there are security issues that, okay, that's a different conversation and this is what it is important for me to say here. That's a different conversation. I mean, every argument is valid and legitimate, but it's not a legal argument, okay? So in terms of international law, nothing, nothing, nothing. No, it, it, it doesn't change anything if, it, if, if, you know what I mean? If the fact that the state of it, the government, of Israel, you know, since 1967 until today, decided that they should wait until the political conditions are ripe to, to do, you know, one thing or another with those territories doesn't mean in any moment in time did we concede on our uh, natural uh, legal rights to those territories. So again, it's not a question of, is it wise? It's, but you're asking me, is it legal? At 100%. So uh, one question I have for you, is that we heard uh, a lot about Pompeo's declaration that settlements were actually legal under international law. Can you please explain to us what 
cha- what he changed in, in American policy, what was the case before this declaration and what was after? Yes, uh, uh, this is a funny story. And of course, when I say funny, I mean tragic. But uh, you know, in Jewish history, we have to laugh. So I refer to it as a funny story. But back in the 70s, during the Carter administration, uh, there was an opinion, a memorandum by uh, one of his advisors, uh, Hensel. And, and this is the only document, formal uh, document that was ever written in, in, in the history of the United States, the uh, relationship with Israel about the legality of the, the territory or Israeli possession of the territory. Now, Jimmy Carter, um, I don't know if you guys are aware of how nice, uh, you know, he, uh, how, how big of a friend he was to the Jewish state, but, uh, you know, the, 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 there was a problem there. And to be perfectly honest, and I've spoken to a lot of people about this, people completely and totally forgot about the existence of this Hensel Memorandum until Barack Obama uh, uh, kind of raised it from the dead uh, uh, to justify Resolution 2334 in the Security Council, which was his parting gift to Israel in, uh, in the Security Council uh, before he left office. And I remember I was shocked. I was shocked. I was, where did this even come from? And when we started uh, 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 kind of researching this, we, we, we found out the story, as I just told you, that people just, you know, totally forgot about it. No one thought that this would, uh, that this is the formal policy of the United States. Obviously, in between, we had the Oslo Accords. I mean, Bill Clinton got a, a Nobel Peace Prize for, for a completely different policy. Uh, uh, so obviously, no one thought that this is still valid. Uh, so I think it was very important, uh, 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 I think, for the, uh, for the next administ- administration, for the Trump administration, to get that revoked because obviously that, that wasn't their position, n- nor was it anyone else's uh, uh, position, again, like other than Carter or Obama at the very end of his uh, uh, term. So they revoked the Hensel resolution. There is another uh, piece of paper somewhere that no one apparently has seen. So I don't know to tell you exactly what it says or if that document really exists. But as far as we know, in terms of uh, official policy, uh, uh, it was a very important step uh, uh, to uh, revoke that Hensel opinion and, and go back to at least a more neutral uh, position on that. And of course, again, the, P- the Trump peace plan uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, portrays a different uh, um, understanding of Israel's legal rights and what can be uh, uh, a more reasonable or, or feasible uh, uh, solution to this conflict. I want to ask one last question before we get to the questions we got from the crowd. Uh, the International Criminal Court, uh, we know that one of the fears or really one of the things that people say to scare Israel is that if you apply sovereignty, uh, then you might find yourself prosecuted in the interna- uh, International Criminal Court. Uh, what do you okay. answer to that? Well, I really try not to laugh. Uh, and, I tell you, and I'll tell you why. Because this whole thing about Israel uh, maybe uh, extending its sovereignty or, or applying its law to certain parts of Area C is new. While the whole investigation is, is, is not at all new, trust me, I've been, I, I, I have a lot of white hair because of that investigation. I spent many, many hours on that uh, craziness. Uh, so, you know, we, we were extremely concerned about the politicization, politicization of the ICC way before we even thought that, uh, you know, this uh, uh, current government might, might actually uh, extend sovereignty to to some of Area C. So, not, you know, so it, it, it is another, it, it's a twisted way to understand the development of, uh, of, of events when, when you think, it, you know, this problem was just born now. And, you know, so I, I, I wrote an op-ed once that titled, uh, will uh, Israel be prosecuted in the ICC if it extends its sovereignty? Yes. Will Israel be prosecuted in the ICC if it doesn't extend sovereignty? Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so we'll get now to questions from the crowd. Uh, so the, I'll try to get through as many as uh, we got a lot of questions. So we'll try to get to, in, the, in the time that we have through as many as we can. 
uh, and then afterwards we'll go on to our next speaker. So the first question from Hugh uh, Kitson, uh, who asks, uh, there are some law lawyers, for example, Malcolm Shaw, who believes that uti possidetis juris doesn't apply to Israel. Uh, how would you counter this argument? Well, <laughs> you know, uh, um, I, I, well, I completely disagree with that, and I would have to, I would have to uh, see why, what's the argument that Malcolm uh, uses to say that it doesn't apply to Israel. I think that, uh, you know, people say that because we, we, as the state of Israel, of course, not we personally, but since the state of Israel hasn't made that argument, you know, it, it, you know from the beginning, then, you know, we're, we're, we're silenced forever from making that argument. I think that, that you know, in, 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 there are some scenarios, like, for example, a criminal proceedings where that might be true. But in this uh, type of uh, situation where, you know, this is, uh, the situation is so different and, you know, it's, it, it was so challenging uh, uh, politically, uh, then, you know, I think it, if we had more time, I would have explained why, what was the mindset and what was the process of thought. Uh, uh, when, when, you know, when, when no one thought to really like build a legal case back in 1967, no one thought that was, you know, even that it, it even matters. I mean, everyone thought that, you know, this is something that we kind of, we will try to leverage until we can get some kind of a peace agreement with the Arab neighboring countries. No one thought about the Palestinians back then. Uh, it wasn't even an issue. No one uh, uh, um, negotiated anything to do with the Palestinians. And the world was different. I mean, obviously, we, we, we didn't have civil society as active as we have today. We didn't have the ICC, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that that argument, and that's the only argument I know, by the way, I don't know any legal argument that will actually convince me that Uti Pusidei Suri doesn't apply, just to say Israel is silent because it, it didn't make it a, in 1967. I think it's, it's crap. So from Paul Kaplan, uh, we, we stayed mostly legal. Now I think it's a little bit of a political question. Uh, in your opinion, what should, become, uh, what should become regarding the status of the Arab Palestinians when sovereignty in, is applied to certain areas of Judea and Samaria? Well, I, I think it's a good question, but I don't think it, it's, it, it is a relevant question to the current uh, uh, situation. Because uh, you know the Israeli government, whether we agree with it or not, or or uh, from whatever side, is not even talking about applying a, a sovereignty to the entirety of the area C, not to mention A or B. So we're talking about some percentage. I don't know. It changes every day, but mainly, uh, uh, but only over uh, 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 Jewish communities, and not even all Jewish communities, but some Jewish communities. So basically, it doesn't change the legal status or any type of circumstances at all uh, for, the, for the Arabs living in those areas. So it's exactly, it will be the same for them tomorrow as it is today. So it, it's just, I think it, it's not relevant. Okay, uh, one, another question. Uh, sorry, one second. From Michael Goodman. Uh, who asked why was Israel's right to exist contested even during the period between 48 and 67 when Israel had uh, very confined borders? I think what he's trying to say is uh, what was the other uh, per, uh, side arguing on a legal uh, basis? I think he's trying to say that it's, uh, it, it shows the hypocrisy of whoever is now claiming, which is it's similar to the argument I have about the ICC. You know, they, they were going to do this for other reasons before we even thought of uh, applying sovereignty. So, uh, I mean, yes, we are a, a thorn on their side, if I'm being uh, um, nice. And, and they've, they have been trying to destroy Israel in any means uh, possible. So it does, it, 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 you know, the war in 67 didn't change any of that. Right. Uh, Steve Feldman is asking, why are so many Jewish groups aggressively denying the land is ours and Jews have a legal right to Judea and Samaria? It's not a very legal question, but if you want to ask, speak. I, you know what, I, I, wanna, I wanna say something about that. Maybe that's not what Steve meant, but I wanna say this. Like, I think that we, are responsible for, for what we are now experiencing around the world. Maybe not 100% because there are the anti-Semites and there is you know, a very powerful uh, Arab uh, 
and lobby and a lot of money involved, but we were silent for so many decades on, on our own legitimacy and our own rights. So uh, this is my, this is how I prefer to look at the world in, in any issue and on any issue is look at yourself and see how you can take responsibility and what you can do better. So I think I'm trying to do better by, you know, doing these type of webinars and writing and, and, and doing, and you're trying to do better by, you know, joining and taking. So I think we're now doing a lot better than we, than we ever did in 50, in 50 plus years. So that's it. We should do more of that. There is uh, one question from Andrea Sp Spindle, which I think uh, really summarizes a lot of things that we heard here today. It seems that international law isn't international at all. I want to add, it seems that international law isn't law at all. Uh, you said that in the beginning. Uh, how many countries actually recognize it? How many countries actually work according to international law? Well, I think countries uh, uh, work according to international law when it suits their interests and, and, and don't work according to when it doesn't. I mean, uh, I mean, just look at, you know, it would take me hours to even name all of the problems, but, you know, look at the situation and uh, just look at what is happening now with the Kurds. I mean, look at, at, at Turkey's attack on the Kurds and uh and 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 the world is silent and and look at the uh you know the, the major countries have major territories including european countries i mean the uk has 14 different uh um colonies still if you will uh, areas under their control it's it's a world of hypocrisy that's uh, i mean unfortunately that's the case great so thanks a lot ifa uh, it was really fascinating and also it helped us uh, get many tools in order to afterwards defend uh, sovereignty uh, from a legal perspective. Uh, I'm going to uh, let Mark introduce our next speaker. So Mark, back okay. to you. Dan, I'm gonna say something with your permission. Uh, okay. We have a whole segment on our website that is now dedicated to uh, uh, educating people on this issue. So we have a legal analysis, we have a Q&A segment, we have a few videos and there will be more and more materials. Uh, uh, so I, I walk, everyone is welcome to, to, to use it, take it. If you wanna use it with your own logo, just email me, I'll send you a clean uh, uh, draft. Just, just use it and, 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 and start talking about this. I think it's, it's, it's incredibly strategic for us to do it now. All right, so thank you. share with them the, uh, the address for the website. And thank you so much. This was great and good luck with everything. Thank you, Aoife. Mark, Mark, you're on mute. Okay, Dan, you hearing me? Okay, so you, Dan, you hear me? Yes, I do. Okay. Aoife, thank you very much. That was terrific. Um, it's important that we have strong spokespeople like yourself. Uh, the ZOA, as you know, we often find ourselves marching as a lone drummer, even though we've been right in so many issues. And, um, you know, what you say is terrific. We've put out a lot of our own materials on this. And I, I, I foresee as um, we look to partner and collaborate with other like-minded organizations and individuals, we look forward to working with you. And we hope when this pandemic ends, uh, when you're next in the States, we'd love to have you speak at our New York headquarter office when, when our offices, you know, when the world opens up. So really terrific, thank you. It's really inspiring to hear folks, other folks that really understand the legitimacy of our claims and can present it so articulately like you just did. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, okay. Mark. We're going to switch gears for the next half hour. Uh, we have a hard stop. Uh, our MK, Javier Knesset, has to break at uh, 1235 sharp. So Sharon Haskell, uh, hopefully she's on. I'm not seeing her, but hopefully she's on. Uh, Alan and Natalie. Uh, Sharon, Mark? Yes. Mark, this is, this is Alan. We're, we're waiting for her to log on. There's one more question that perhaps you can ask Ifa if she's still on. Well, while go we're waiting for her to log on. No, that, that's, that's sure. great. Uh, so you mean, uh, you mean Ken's question? There you go. Okay. Our good friend, Ken Abramowitz. Uh, I'm going to give him the credit for this question. Uh, do you, I, I don't even know where your answer will go. Do you have enough resources to sue all the Muslim countries except Saudi Arabia for their illegal occupation of Christian countries? 
during the past 1400 years. Wow. Yeah, the, hi Ken. Um, I think it's a great question. The problem is, and again, it shows how, you know, rigged in a way the system is because there is no, there, there isn't a venue for us to do that. You know, if you wanna, even if you wanna uh, go against Syria now for what's going on in the, you know, against the Kurds or anything else, there's nothing that you can do. There is no suitable uh, forum in the world. So when we say that the ICC is incredibly politicized, th that's exactly the reason. I mean, f out of all the atrocities and all the wars and all the genocides and all the uh, uh, occupations around the world, they choose to go after the one Jewish state. So uh, I wish there was, Ken, because this, is the, this would have been a worthy cause, maybe, or there are other worthy causes. But again, international law doesn't give you uh, the proper forum for that. OK, thank you. I understand that our, our second speaker is on. So please, Ifa, feel free to stay on as, as long as you can or want. So terrific job. Our second speaker is uh, Javier Knesset, Sharen Haskell. Sharen is a deputy speaker of the Knesset. She was born in Toronto, Canada, which for you, the rest of you is different from Montreal, where Dan was from. Um, she her, and her family immigrated to Israel in 1985. Uh, Sharen enlisted in the IDF in the border guard, serving in Jerusalem during the second intifada, and she finished with the rank of first sergeant. She entered the Knesset at the really young age of 31, her work in the Knesset focuses on free market oriented economic reforms and what we think is most important, defending Israel on the international stage. She's become one of Israel's most eloquent spokespersons for Israel's rights, both within Israel and internationally. So Sharon, wel Sharon welcome to uh, ZOA's webinar and we're delighted to have you and we hope you'll be a regular with us. Um, I am going to start off with uh, uh, the first question, and we know you have a hard stop at 12.35, so we'll be mindful of that in terms of my questioning and trying to get in some chat questions. And there are a lot of chat questions and participants on the line. So the first question, please tell us as of today, uh, Israel time, what is the latest on the sovereignty status? Many of us saw last night after Shabbat, we saw a number of articles. We don't know whether it's true or not, about uh, legislation or, or relative to the coalition um, being submitted and the infamous point 29 being deleted or not deleted and that affecting whether uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu really has the sole say on uh, moving forward with sovereignty or whether somehow uh, alternate Prime Minister Gans has you know the right of consent as well. So please talk to us about that, what you know as of right now on that issue. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. And it's such a pleasure um, to see you all uh, and that you're keeping in touch and informed on everything that's happening in Israel, uh, even though all the challenges, uh, the health one, the economical one, and the traveling one as well to Israel. Um, I'm here always. I'm more than happy to participate in uh, your events, obviously, face-to-face uh, -face and also on Zoom as well. So I'll touch first the um, issues concerning sovereignty uh, in Israel and the application of it as soon as possible. Um, there's two aspects for that, uh, the technical part of it and the political side of it. Um, on the technical um, side of it, um, yeah, yesterday also, um, uh, we've tried to pass through some um, the canon, which is sort of like a uh, um, uh, rules of government, uh, sort of to say, um, of the coalition principles on what we are going to advance in the next few years. Um, it didn't pass, but obviously, um, in order to create to actually apply sovereignty we need the decision of the prime minister this is the most key important in that if he choose and decide to do that we'll be able to do that within weeks not months um, so on the technical side obviously we formed a coalition um, with partners that disagree with us on ideological issues not just sovereignty on issues of economy, on issues of uh, many, many different issues on uh, 
uh, you know, uh, the court system in Israel, the law enforcement in Israel. So we're very, very different. There's quite a lot of clashes on a lot of these issues um, between us. It's not easy. This is not a co the coalition that we've expected or that we actually wanted. Uh, but we had to compromise. And in that compromise, we have a coalition agreement uh, where we, I can tell you on the political aspect of it, we were not very happy with. The only thing that sort of kept us uh, um, going through with a coalition that we're not happy with is the promise for sovereignty in July. Now, on the technical part, with those coalition agreements, they have to abide by them and they have to agree to sovereignty. There is no question about it. So technically, it is at the hand of the prime minister with saying a lot of technical difficulties that we need to resolve. The political aspect of it um, is that us in the Likud party, in particular me, um, I've already voiced it in many interviews and passed it on um, to whoever needed to hear that. And I can tell you that I am not alone. Um, we will not stay in this coalition if there will not be sovereignty. Um, we definitely are having many challenges that we need to face and that we need to overcome uh, that came with the coronavirus. And we are not ignoring this. Um, but we have our voters, we have promises for our voters, and the only ideological, um, let's say, uh, um, uh, term that we insisted on in those coalition agreement and giving up a lot of what we've promised was sovereignty. Um, and so me, with many more of the Likud members, I have passed it on that we will not stay in a coalition where there will not be sovereignty. Um, so uh, there's political pressure uh, going on the prime minister as well, not just from the party, from us, um, not just from the public, um, but also uh, from the international community as well. Um, I think it was a week ago, some leaders in the Christian community as well I wrote a couple of articles and a couple of letters saying that they demand also that Israel will go through with sovereignty. Um, so in, I, I'm, I'm hopeful and I hope that within a few weeks we'll be able to apply it. That's terrific. As you know, ZOA has a very active campaign. Hopefully you saw our wonderful billboards. Amazing um, billboards. Very <laughs> and it exciting. reminds every morning and every evening anyone that leaves or come into Jerusalem, into the Knesset, what our mission is. Yeah, so I want to, you know, thank Dan, uh, our Israel office representative. Dan was very helpful in that, and Natalie and others on the, uh, on our marketing communications. And we actually have a, a, a sovereignty campaign steering committee that we meet weekly to discuss all these issues, because this is incredibly important to ZOA. We know we're the only organization that's really, you know, leading the charge here but we feel very strongly about it. We are concerned ab about timing. So I did want to ask you, you briefly alluded to it, but ultimately when the coalition was formed, uh, Gans came in really with very few seats relative. We know that th that was a deal that was needed and you know to get the uh, uh, current government in place, but he really did have a limited number of seats. Polls, which are only polls, continue to show that the prime minister and Lee could are you know very very uh, trending upward in the poll, shall I say? Um, so we want to kind of give you a little bit of chizuk and maybe ask you to comment back on the fact that if there's much more efforts by whomever outside of could to push back even within the coalition, what are the possibilities of moving to a dreaded next election? Because this is such a critical issue and there is a time element to it. So I won't really count on polls here in Israel. Uh, it's very rare that they can actually predict, especially uh, when there's not even a political campaign uh, well ahead um, of what the results are going to be. 
we need to look on the past. And the fact was that we were not able to form a coalition by ourselves. We could not form a right-wing coalition. This is what we aspired for. This is what we wanted. It would have given us a chance to make some incredible changes here in Israel that were very much needed for the past 30 years, historical changes. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't win these elections. Um, the understanding of the crisis that was coming forced us to build a coalition that we were not, were not happy with. Um, the positions that our ministers we were not happy with that either. Uh, some of the legislations, we are encountering a lot of issues, a lot of problems. Um, there's a lot of difficulties. Um, and, but we did insist, as I said before, on sovereignty. And we're, uh, at least I'm pushing forward, and I'm telling you straight, straight up, um, uh, we're not afraid of elections. Uh, the public is expecting us to stand on our ideological promises as well. And if we can't keep, you know, out of many election promises, this one single promise that we uh, promise to keep in the coalition agreement, we will not be afraid to go into elections. Okay, good. I want to take a little brief uh, right turn here, a left turn, because I want our participants on this webinar, and we've just had uh, uh, a tremendous series of webinars throughout this whole pandemic. We mentioned it at the top of the program here. And there are so many people on this webinar that may really not know you. So why don't you take five minutes, tell us about your path. Uh, you, you've done quite a bit in your short lifetime so far. So talk to us about Toronto to where we are today in the Knesset. Fit it all in five minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> take six. Um, yeah. Um, well, um, I was born in Canada to an Israeli father and a Moroccan mother, um, a newcomer from France. They have fled from Morocco to France. Um, I was raised here in Israel since the age of one. Um, I've got family, though, all around the world. So my dad lives in Canada. My sister is in Texas. Uh, my grandmother's in France, cousins all around Europe. Um, so I quite, it's easy for me to connect with the Jewish community all around the world and to be part of that bridge between the younger Jewish community and between Israel. Um, that's why I've been chosen on many delegations to come and represent Israel, uh, to come and do also, even with the ZOA, a campus tour um, all around, I think it was five days with six or seven campuses. Uh, all around, uh, which was amazing to try and combat anti-Semitism and, you, you know, BDS organizations and things like that. Um, so growing up here in Israel was very important to, for me to fulfill a, a position, an important position in the army. Um, I joined as a com in a combat position in the border guards of Israel. Uh, it's called Magav in Hebrew. Um, I was a commander as well. I'm very proud to have some of my uh, female rookies uh, basically um, breaking some glass ceilings in special units, in special places, uh, things like that. I was able to uh, push them further as well. Um, after my military service, I moved to Australia. I've studied there my profession. Uh, I lived there for seven years. It's a very important profession in Israeli politics. I'm a veterinary nurse. So I worked in an animal hospital. Some may say that I arrived in the, in the, in, in the real zoo of Israel, <laughs> uh, the Israeli parliament. Um, and uh, uh, after seven years in Australia, I moved back to Israel. Um, I finished my degree in international relations at the Open University of Israel. Um, I have became more and more active politically. I never thought I will end up in politics, but I started becoming more and more involved. My family didn't really have a connection or anything to that, um, to the political life. So I really started from, from being a, a, a normal active in my branch of Likud and in my university cells. Um, 
And I started voicing a bit of a different voice. So I speak, and most of my legislation also today in the Knesset speaks about economical freedom. Uh, the capitalistic, uh, more approach, less bureaucracy, less regulations, uh, less taxes. Israel is one of the most complicated places to make, to do business. Uh, some extremely high tax rates uh, for us. Many times the government uh, is getting involved in uh, entrepreneurship, in small businesses, in a way that it actually uh, prevent us, the younger generation, to continue and develop Israel economy from an economical perspective, to create more companies and develop them. And so I've been a unique voice for the past five years on those issues. Um, I come from a, a, a very uh, strict and a very clear uh, right-wing approach about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As well, I sit in the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, and I represent it almost every single day. Um, the committee is, is one of the most important committees um, in Israel. And over there, I found some of my talents uh, in foreign relations as well, uh, and bringing Israel's agenda and Israel's interest into the front line of uh, you know, international community, conventions, delegations, things like that. So that's like in a really brief, like, okay. Thank you. Well, for those that don't know, the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee in Knesset may actually be the most important committee. And it's also terrific to see some new, younger, fresher faces in, in Likud because, you know, we do need to have uh, youth and, and, and combined experience uh, as we go forward. Let me ask you um, one more question for myself, and we have a whole bunch of questions in the uh, in the chat room, and so we'll try to turn to that. I know you have the hard stop. So um, one of the challenges that we ZOA face, you know that, you see it. We really are the, the lone voice, the lone major voice. I mean, there are other organizations, good organizations that, that, that do speak out, but in terms of having, you know, a presence and, 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 a, and a response, from the media and, and, and the Jewish community at large, ZOA is, is really the most significant uh, organization that is really pushing uh, the sovereignty issue and other issues like that. We are very frustrated, very frustrated that we cannot get other major Jewish organizations involved. We're equally frustrated that we can't get the Jewish community at large who refuse to accept the fact that Israel has a legal right I could go through our 13 points in our sovereignty bulletin. I'm not going to do that. People who have seen it, they can look it up. But from your perspective in Israel, where you, you're really on the front line there, you know, how do you see the issue? How do you see trying to convey to the so many Jewish organizations, even if they don't feel and agree with our positions totally, at least, you know, give Israel a break. Why do you have to be so offensive? Why can't you say, okay, we may disagree, but we agree that Israel has a right to do so. So what, what ideas or thoughts do you have and what frustration do you have when you speak to various groups? Yeah, I mean, it, it is frustrating and it is a challenge that we need to face as a Jewish community as well. Um, we have disagreements here in Israel on those issues as well. And we fight with the opposition constantly. Um, and, you know, I, I had a meeting last week with uh, WUJA, so uh, World Jewish Students Organizations. Um, yeah. um, and they were asking me many difficult questions exactly like that. And I think the most important thing is the conversation. Um, explaining them, uh, you know, at an eye level, uh, what it actually means explaining them some facts that they are really not aware of because there is so much uh, really misleading information on the internet about our history, about the geography, about the economy, about uh, the ruling system here in Israel. So to be honest, they're really uh, misinformed. And the most important thing is to send out information about it uh, real statistics, real uh, documents about what's really happening here. Um, another thing that I actually told them, which is important, is that the Jewish community is an incredible and a very valuable 
uh, and it's part of Israel, okay? Uh, and it's very important that we have all these discussions because obviously this affects the Jewish community as well. But at the end of the day, the people who will have to live or die by the results of, of Israel's action is Israelis. And those who come to Israel, and there's many from the Jewish community from the left and the right who come to Israel to volunteer, to work, to make their life here, um, it's okay and they can make the decisions as well. We have democratic election. Um, this issue is on the table constantly. Uh, anyone who put, uh, you know, a right wing, a Likud, um, um, Petek, um, a Likud, um, sticker, uh, campaign sticker. Yeah, that campaign sticker in the ballot. Exactly. Um, they they know that they vote for sovereignty as well. Um, and so if you're here in Israel and you participate in the elections, it's your decisions as well, because the results, you're going to have to live by it as well. Um, so it's okay to have the discussion and to share this information and even to have arguments. It's absolutely okay. But at the end of the day, the decisions is the Israelis people decision. Um, and we've done that for more than 70 years even though the international community did not support Israel on so many issues, um, they tried to describe some kind of doomsday event uh, just because we'll put sovereignty in the Golan Heights or uh, even bring the embassy, the American embassy to Jerusalem. And you know what? It didn't come true. Uh, on this issue, I believe it will not come true as well. But what's important is that me, my family, my parents, and my children will have to live by that decision. And this is what I keep in my mind. Um, and that's what they have to keep in their mind as well. When they are calling for me uh, to support a two-state solution, a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria, they don't understand, but I, I, obviously in different meetings I'm explaining that, that they are putting my children and my family at risk of every single day having missiles being shot from Kalkilia to Kfar Saba, my hometown. Okay? And the results of the actions that they want me to do put a risk on my family and my future kids with God's help. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I think it's important to put that in, in that kind of context. Okay. That that's terrific. Let me, um, uh, mindful of the time I'm going to turn to our chat room and try to, we'll try to get through as many questions as possible within the next, you know, six or seven minutes. I know you have to break. So from our own terrific Steve Feldman, who runs our Philadelphia office, the Israel me, and I know some of these you've touched upon a little bit, but the Israel media seems determined to convince the Israeli public that extending sovereignty is wrong, and they keep referring to it as annexation, which at ZOA we do not, mm -hmm. reasserting sovereignty. Uh, can the Knesset do anything about it? What is being done to make sure the public knows the facts? So, um... Uh, obviously, uh, you know, politicians don't control the media. Um, and it, it's good. And they have a lot of criticism over us. And obviously, most of the journalists, I mean, all journalists have sort of their own uh, uh, thoughts and their own perspective of life and their own ideology. There isn't a single individual, definitely not reporters, who come on a mission to report and inform the public with their own ideology, political uh, uh, grasps or political opinions and things like that. Um, unfortunately, yes, I think it's sort of similar also in America, but most of the journalists here in Israel hold a more left-wing approach and they're not afraid to voice it in the media as well. Uh, on social media, in the mainstream media, time after time, they are doing that. Um, I think that uh, most Israeli and most right wing are starting to have new coming channels. Uh, so there's channel 20 that many of them have moved to, not enough, but 
some of them. Uh, we have social media to keep them informed as well. Uh, we have a couple of radio stations and radio anchors um, that people are more and more listening to them, at least from our camp. Um, and I think that some of it is definitely our fault as well. Um, I mean, for years and we, years, we haven't pushed our sort of um, elite intellectual right wing uh, layer uh, towards NGOs, towards the media, towards academic. And the left wing had so many organizations and donations um, to um, acquire for them the right education or the right uh, programs in order to move those uh, people from the left wing into those positions. Uh, and we did, we're, we, to be honest, we weren't smart enough to do that as well. And we don't do that as well as they do. Um, it's changing. There's different programs. Uh, for example, just last week, I had a speech at the final graduation of um, a campus called um, um, the campus for uh, identity and uh, it's difficult for me to translate it. Um, but um, this, for example, is a program that gives the tools to many intellectuals in the right wing as well, uh, the tools to go and start uh, a career in that path as well. We have to do that more and more. We have to support right wing organizations that can give that kind of uh, uh, tools and, and, and facilities for the right wing intellectual elite to continue and develop themselves in the country and the nation's sort of institutes. Okay, uh, I'm gonna squeeze in two questions to you. You can answer them both. I know we're running up against the clock. So let me just say the first question is, um, we've talked a lot about, you know, the could views on, on the sovereignty issue. What's your sense um, that you wanna convey about what the population outside the Israel population outside of the could and the right wing feel about sovereignty, that's one. And the other one, we talked a little bit about how important this is to Likud members such as yourself. Are there others like you that would bolt the coalition, that the coalition would break up over this issue if it just gets bogged down? Um, so to the second question, absolutely yes. Um, I speak to many members of the Likud party who are quite frustrated with it. And I'm sure they'll have the, uh, to, they, they'll be brave enough to do and to put that in place as well. Um, the first question, I didn't exactly understood it. The, the, the issue, in America, the Jews are more than split on this issue. In Israel, there still is a split on the issue of sovereignty. And so we wanted your sense, since we have the media, which is basically le left wing, and we have very you know, vocal- In Israel or in America? Israel, Israel. What's, okay. How would you convey the general population's view on the sovereignty issue? So how Israelis view the sovereignty? Yeah. Um, I would say that right now, they, the, the general discussion is more about economical issues than the health issues. Um, and sovereignty have somewhat come down in the general public discussion, unfortunately. Um, but we have, uh, you know, not an easy uh, challenge right now with a rise in the infected in coronavirus. And so that's what's playing on the minds of Israelis. That's what we've, we're discussing. That's uh, uh, the general discussions in the parliament as well and in the media. Um, I believe that within two weeks, three weeks, we'll be able to resolve most of it and continue to speak about um, those issues. And I believe that this will be one of the major issues that will be discussed. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I so, can take another question oh, as well. Great, okay, terrific. <laughs> I'm going to, there, there are so many uh, terrific questions here. Let me pull up one from Cheryl Silver. She, and this will be the last question that I wanna thank you for, for uh, participating. Cheryl asks, are public warnings by France, good question, are public warnings by France, Germany, Jordan, and Egypt of negative consequences in their relationships with Israel if Israel asserts sovereignty? Is that having any impact in your view 
on the prime That's minister? A great question. Really good question. I get asked that a lot. Now, it's important to understand the process that are happening right now around the Middle East. Um, for a couple of years now, we have been building bridges uh, with many countries in the Arab world, some official and some non-official as well. Those bridges um, are being constructed with them, including Egypt and Jordan, uh, despite our disagreement on the Palestinian issues. So many people will say, uh, you know, I'm not going, uh, Israel will never have peace in the region if Israel uh, will not solve the Palestinian issue. Well, we have. We've made a peace agreement with Egypt without resolving the Palestinian issue. We've signed a peace agreement with Jordan without signing the, the without resolving the Palestinian issue. We've been building bridges based on mutual security interest, on mutual economical interest with those countries who no one thought will ever have relationship with, not just without resolving the Palestinian problem, but during speaking about sovereignty, during the time of applying so the Declaration of America about the Golan Heights, during moving the embassy of the United States to Jerusalem, it is not a question of whether those ties are going to break off. Um, it's a matter in their world of respect. They see how we stand our ground. They see that we are good allies, that we will not let them down. And saying facts, um, you know, the, just a few years ago, one of their greatest friends let them down by signing an agreement with one of their main enemies. Um, and they see Israel as a strong, sovereign country in the middle of a very difficult question with a lot of power, with a lot of knowledge, and they want to share it. And it's interesting, you know, um, there was a, a remark that obviously there's a lot of uh, 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 people and journalists that are speaking and saying, Oh, how will the Arab world will stay in touch with Israel after sovereignty? So some of them speak about it. One of the ambassadors of the United uh, Arab Emirates uh, spoke in one of the uh, European uh, magazines um, saying um, that we disagree with Israel on the Israeli-Palestinian issue and we definitely oppose sovereignty. Now that's okay. We can disagree. We still disagree with Jordan. We still disagree with Egypt. Um, it's incredible because after this, this declaration, many left-wing reporters have celebrated, uh, you know, the, what they predict is right. But it was incredible to see not an ambassador, but the foreign minister of the Arab Emirates coming with an incredible declaration saying, that ambassador is right. We disagree with Israel on sovereignty and on the Palestinian issues, but it doesn't mean we cannot cooperate on the coronavirus, on security issues, on economical um, issues. And that's from the foreign minister. Never heard something like that before, okay? And so we need to understand that the Arab world have to speak in one voice outside, but to Israel, it speaks in a completely different way. And sovereignty will only strengthen the relationships with many of these countries. It will be able to build an economical, uh, far and long lasting uh, future between us and those countries. Once we control completely and once we apply sovereignty in the Jordan Valley, if investors can come and start to invest long term in the economy in this area. I mean, there's so many things that we can develop and do. Um, beside that, what we are seeing happening with Iran, with Syria, with Lebanon, some of our enemies, definitely one that may would of reply on a matter of sovereignty. Well, they have their own challenges to answer to them right now. They are going through one of the worst economical crises um, that they've seen. Uh, uh, people have absolutely no way to buy food right now. Um, the value of their coins is dropping every single day. 
Uh, I think uh, the Iranian coin have dropped, it was 20% or something. Um, the, the Lebanese coin, I think it's almost at 50% uh, decline. I mean, it's crazy what's happening there. And the voices on the street, they know they cannot blame Israel. For the first time, for example, Hezbollah are trying to say it's because of Israel, but they know it's not. And for the first time, the Lebanese people are going out in the streets and calling um, for the um, uh, disarmament of Hezbollah in Lebanon, which is never heard before. You hear reporter uh, speaking about Israel openly, friendly. Um, so, you know, all of these doomsday scenarios that those left-wing reporters are trying to spread, they, it, it didn't happen before. I don't believe they will happen in the future as well. Okay, thank you. We're gonna we're gonna leave that. There are so many other questions here. You've been terrific. Um, I just want to say to our group at large out there that unfortunately, because of the um, coronavirus, we did cancel our summer uh, uh, campus uh, trips to Israel. Very unfortunately, we still are looking forward to hopefully in February, late February, having our annual Z ZOA uh, VIP mission as we've had the last several years and. We know we're gonna we're gonna have you speak to us as one of our, our lead speakers, and um, yes, you know yes, Howard yes. Howard Katzoff, I believe, is uh, on the webinar. He's one of our primary cogs, and uh, to everyone on the webinar, he's one of the primary cogs in getting that uh, Israel uh, trip going. So if you're interested, uh, you know we know we the Corona is not done yet, but folks on the webinar should should reach out to Howard so we can start to gear people's interest, even though we know there's a long way off. We also, when Corona opens up, when finishes and or tamps down, we really look very much forward to having you as, as well as you find in separate presentations at our New York headquarters. We have beautiful offices in uh, Midtown Manhattan, which uh, will one day reopen publicly. <laughs> and uh, we very much encourage um, having you join us. You're a terrific spokesman, not only for, for Likud, but also for Israel and the issues that are very, very dear to us. So we thank you very, very much for being with us. And thank we hope you, you and so your family much. are well. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet you and see you all. Um, and I'll definitely be more than happy to participate in any event that you have, especially your yearly one. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Okay, everyone else in the webinar, we've uh, we got a few extra minutes here. We went over our, uh, you know, sort of uh, committed one hour timeline, but most people stayed with us. So again, on behalf of ZOA, on behalf of our, our senior staff and, and uh, Alan and, and Natalie and, and Mort Klein and everyone, we wanna thank you very much for participating in this webinar. We have two great programs coming up this week. On Wednesday, we have book club number 13 with Ambassador Dory Gold. That's at 1 p.m. The link to, the, to register will be posted either in the chat or on our general ZOA uh, website. And Thursday at 7 p.m., we have, quote, Pittsburgh, stronger than hate, anti-Israel activists weaponized university against Jewish professors. So we hope you'll uh, sign up for those. And I hope everyone has a good day. And please keep a ZOA uh, in your heart and minds and pocketbooks. As you know, we, as I, we've said, we've spent a lot of money in the sovereignty campaign. We feel it's well worth it. Uh, but you know, we do need to uh, uh, raise funds as we can so that we can move forward appropriately. I want to give folks back uh, the rest of their afternoon on Sunday. I hope everyone stays well and, and healthy. And we'll see you all in our next ZOA webinar. Thank you, everyone. And thank you very much to Sharon and, and, and uh, Yifa as well for the terrific job here. Have a good day, everyone.